for the town of Williston. Uh, thanks to you all for uh, coming to this uh, second webinar of um, focused on the Catamount Community Forest and the forestry work that um, we're proposing. Um, Ethan Tapper, the Chittenden County Forester, has kind of organized these webinars um, uh, for public outreach and has drafted a forest management plan for Catamount. So you're going to find out um, some of the proposed forest management at Catamount um, related to habitat enhancement tonight. And um, we have uh, Mark Labar from Vermont Audubon with us and Katie Kane from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Andrea Shortsleeve from the Department of Fish and Wildlife and Ethan Tapper, uh, Chittenden County Forester, to uh, share some information with you. Um, and I guess we would just ask that you keep yourself muted. Um, and if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat window. And at the end of the presentations, we'll be um, going through those questions and, um, and answering the questions. Um, great. So that's all I have to say. Thanks, Take Melinda. Yeah. And so again, my name is Ethan Tapper, the Chittenden County Forester. Uh, I know many of you. Um, but just to give you the, the rundown on, on who county foresters are and what we do, uh, we work for the state, we work for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And the biggest part of our job is helping the owners of, of uh, privately owned forest land figure out how to manage their land in a more responsible way. Um, Vermont is about 75% forested, about 80% of that land is privately owned. And so it's a pretty big job. It's a pretty big deal um, in that all of these public services, right, that we all enjoy from clean air to clean water to wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration and storage, pollinator habitat, all these other things, is really linked to the responsible management of privately owned forested lands. Um, and so we do a bunch of different things to sort of get at that and help people, private landowners, figure out how to manage their forests better. Um, but another part of our job is that we assist towns in the management of their town forest in some way. Um, and we have since the admin of the county forester program in the 40s. Uh, and so for me, I just really love working with town forests. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because they're amazing. And in just in Chittenden County, there's about 4,200 acres of town forests. Um, that's about a dozen, 13 town forests. Um, and they're all really, really special and cool. Uh, but also because it, it provides us a place to demonstrate amazing management. Um, and so one of the things I want to talk about um, with the Catamount Community Forest and the purpose for this is to, dem is to talk about some of the management that we want to do that I've proposed in the forest management plan that I've written. Uh, for the Catamount Community Forest and just give you a chance to hear about it and ask questions about it. Um, we also have are trying to collect more input as we move from this proposed forest management plan that I've drafted to hopefully one that's being approved by the Williston Select Board. Um, and so we'll also share a survey with you where you can um, provide feedback on these presentations and also on the work that we want to do. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. And away we go. So the Catamount Community Forest, it's a 393 acre uh, forest owned by the town of Williston, just acquired in 2019. Um, it is, was acquired by the town and conserved with the help for the Trust for Public Land and Kate Warner, she's here. It was a big, big part of that. And also private donors and the US Forest Service provided grant funding um, and others. It's managed for a whole bunch of different things, like a lot of our town lands. It's managed for education, recreation, wildlife habitat, forest management, water quality, uh, and many other things. And as you can see, it's uh, one of the things that's really interesting and special about the Catamount Community Forest is that it is um, a block of a big chunk of intact forest land on the edge of what is an increasingly uh, fragmented part of our county, so the sort of Tap Taps Corners area of Williston. Um, you can see that it's sort of uh, this rare block in that sort of northeastern corner of Williston. Um, the purpose of the forest management plan, and so again, this the purpose of this workshop is sort of twofold. So it's to 
give you a lot of information about uh, birds and wildlife habitat and how we manage for those things in, in the course of the management work that we do. And then also at the same time, I want to give you guys in, a chance to ask questions about and learn about the forest management plan that I've, that I've written and proposed for the Catamount Community Forest. Um, the Catamount Community Forest had this really robust management plan uh, writing process in, in 2018, where they got this huge committee of all these stakeholders together and drafted what is called a management plan. A management plan is different from a forest management plan because this management plan is this big, broad governance, doc, governance document. It uh, says, you know, sort of the, the goals and objectives that will guide the management of this town forest. It, what it does not do is provide a lot of specifics about the management of forests and ecosystems at Catamount. And so the goal of this forest management plan is um, to satisfy Section 1C of the Catamount Community Forest Conservation Easement. So you're, if you want to do forest management, you're required to have a forest management plan according to the, the conservation easement that the Catamount Community Forest has. And to provide a, a much more fine scale, detailed series of recommendations for how we're going to manage the Catamount Community Forests for all these different things over the next 10 years. So it is an addendum, uh, not a replacement of that 2018 management plan, which if you guys look at it, it's a really impressive document. We certainly wouldn't want to replace it. We're just sort of providing more details on this one specific part of it. Uh, you can find that draft forest management plan that I've written in its entirety um, and the link to the survey that we'd like you all to take on the Williston Town website. So the, the forest management plan is comprehensive. It has a bunch of different sections. Uh, basically how this all evolves is it evolves into this kind of like monster of a document. It's like 60 pages. Um, and the reason for that is because every time I'm writing one of these things, people think of another thing that we should be addressing. I'm like, oh yeah, we should be talking about carbon or we should be talking about emerald ash borer. And it adds up into a lot of stuff, but there's a lot there um, that is worth saying about this, about this property. And it certainly is worthy of being managed in a really intentional way. Um, if you get a chance to check it out, I think it's, it's pretty cool. Um, one of the things that are, that are sort of mapped in the, in the forest management plan is these ecological protection zones. And so um, the Catamount Community Forest is encumbered with, which just means subject to a conservation easement. So can never be developed, can never be subdivided, um, and has these other provisions that are basically protecting the natural resources and the uses of the Catamount Community Forest. Specific to the Catamount Community Forest, um, this area here um, in the north here, this uh, bluish bubbly looking area in here, these are riparian buffers. So areas around streams where they're being buffered basically to protect them and preserve their water quality. These uh, whitish areas with the blue in them are wetlands that are also protected by these special protection zones called uh, WPZs. This area right here in the western portion of the catamount, this uh, dark pink is a vernal pool and around it is a vernal pool primary protection zone. So a hundred foot area around it in which no management will occur. And then around that an, an additional 400 foot area around that in which uh, management is restricted. And so basically the goal of that is to protect vernal pools which are this really important uh, breeding habitat in the spring for amphibians. And so there's a couple different um, things that I really want to talk about. Obviously, this is the project we're talking about tonight, mostly. Um, but there's, there's a couple of other things that I'm really excited about. Um, I'm calling this sort of broadly, we're talking about wildlife habitat enhancement on the Catamount Community Forest. Um, and I know that this map is really, really busy. But what you need to know is that there's basically two things that we want to do. And these things are going to be, you're going to learn more about these from other presenters. Um, so I'm not going to describe them in detail, um, but basically this bright blue area is a stand that is very young in the Catamount Community Forest. So it's in many cases like less than 40 years old, which is really young for a forest. Some of it is abandoned Christmas tree plantations. A lot of it is densely, densely infected, uh, infested with common buckthorn, which is an invasive exotic plant, um, which is very, very noxious and tough to deal with and, and has serious negative ramifications for forest diversity and wildlife habitat. Um, in this area, we want to create some young forest habitat, which is basically um, just bigger openings in the forest, uh, creating two to three patch cuts, each of which would be 
three to five acres in size over a 50 acre stand. So that sounds like a lot, but um, over a 50 acre stand, it, it is not as much as it seems like. And it's certainly, we wouldn't be cutting this whole area that's outlined in blue. It would just be occurring somewhere within this bright blue area. The other thing that we wanna do is uh, create habitat for the golden winged warbler, which is a, a bird species of concern that Audubon and others are spending a lot of energy trying to create habitat for. Um, and that's in this area that is uh, covered in this bright green polygon area. So these are the, the habitat that golden winged warblers like basically is this sort of shrubby um, fields reverting to forest kind of habitat. And that's exactly what we have here in that bright green area. Um, and so those are the, on the ground, here's Governor Chittenden Road, here's the parking area for Catamount. These are the areas that we're looking at doing this work. Um, both of these would also be followed with invasive species treatment because both of these areas are, have pretty serious infestations of these invasive exotic plants that are a concern for wildlife habitat and forest growth. Um, we're hoping to do these soon. Obviously, like all, this, all of our scheduling is completely up in the air because of COVID. Um, it could happen as soon as August 1st of this year, depending on when this forest management plan uh, is approved and, and when our partners are able to do it. But it could also happen in the winter or, or some other time before April 1st of next year. Or if we can't do it, we'll do it uh, uh, this year. We'll do it some, sometime in the future. Um, it will be, uh, it will not, so again, it won't cover anywhere near the, the entirety of these total areas. It'll just occur within these areas. And it will occur over a relatively short period of time. So we're talking about a couple of weeks. Um, these are funded by our partners. So these treatments would not cost the town anything. Um, this would basically just be work that we'd be doing just to create really good wildlife habitat and to demonstrate good wildlife habitat. I also wanna give a, a shout out to um, some other work that we're hoping to get done in the next couple of years. Um, we did a, a workshop on this a couple of weeks ago. In that northwestern area of Catamount, we also are hoping to do some demonstration, um, adaptation and restoration work with uh, uh, Tony D'Amato, Willison resident and really amazing uh, professor of forestry at UVM um, and others at UVM and to just do some really cool demonstration uh, forestry of how we manage our forests in light of a changing climate, um, both at Catamount and then in the south of Catamount. So this, this area here in yellow is the area that we're hoping to to do this project in at Catamount. And then we're also hoping to use it, to do it in this uh, area to the south of Catamount, which is a UVM owned property called Talcott Forest and to use um, this truck road and a log landing here on the Catamount Community Forest basically so we can replicate the work that we're doing here in the north of the forest um, in the south. And this would be something that would generate revenue. We could um, use it to fund invasive species treatment, more wildlife habitat, uh, enhancement work, other stuff that's non-commercial. So all of this work, if you, if you guys have seen any of the work that I've done like at the Hinesburg Town Forest, one thing that I'm really, really, that's really important to me and that I think is one of the most important parts of these projects is that we incorporate uh, demonstration and education into them because, you know, we can do these things and we know that it's good and we know that it's uh, create, important for creating really good wildlife habitat, but if we can also couple that with some really serious uh, demonstration and education, we can also improve the management across the landscape. And so um, demonstrate to landowners, to conservation organizations, to lay people, how we manage for these really diverse, robust, resilient forests, which have lots of great wildlife habitat and other things. And so this is a major goal of this forest management plan is that in everything we're gonna do, we're gonna incorporate this really robust outreach process. Um, so again, the Heinsberg Town Forest um, over the last couple of years is just a, this is an example of, of this kind of a project. Over the last couple of years, I've been uh, doing some demonstration forest management, basically a, a demonstration logging job, um, where I'm trying to showcase what really good uh, forest management looks like. And so in service of that, over a couple of winters, we, I hosted 19 free public events attended by about over 500 people. Um, focusing on all different kinds of stuff from wildlife to birds to carbon, recreation, emerald ash borer. We did indoor presentations, outdoor presentations. We did a history night, um, a storytelling night, and incorporated all these sponsors from Woodlands Association, from our coverage, from Fish and Wildlife, Audubon Vermont, Fellowship of the Wheel, the Outdoor Gear Exchange, City Market Co-op, Vermont Pride Center, 
um, just to really try and get people out there because I really believe that um, forest management uh, done responsibly is something we can all be really proud of and that most people believe in it, they just don't know it yet. Also, I wanna stress that with, with all this stuff, um, one of the really important things that we need to be thinking about is that understanding that this work is, will be temporarily disrupted to the existing trail system at Catamount for some period of time. So in case of this wildlife habitat management, again, we're probably talking about a couple of weeks, but that's still disruption to that usage. And that usage is really important and valuable. The Catamount Outdoor Family Center um, now is a nonprofit, has a license agreement with the town of Williston, and we really want to balance recreation, understanding how important that, it, that is to the community, um, and then also really good forest management. I'm just going to zoom through this because I uh, am short on time here. There's some other threats that are addressed in the forest management plan that I think people need to be aware of. There's a really serious invasive exotic plant problem, mostly buckthorn, honeysuckle, Japanese barberry, uh, mostly in the southern portion of that uh, block of the forest north of Governor Chittenden Road. Deer browse is also a concern. It's obvious that there's an overabundance of deer and there's no deer uh, hunting that's allowed in the current management plan for the Catamount Community Forest. Climate change is sort of this existential threat to, to many different things that we care about in our forests. Um, and emerald ash borer is also something that's coming that we need to, uh, and we need to manage our forests in light of that uh, specifically with, with the understanding that that will be coming soon and affecting our ash trees. Uh, we're gonna send out this survey link. Um, I really hope you can do it and just let us know what you think about this the forest management plan. Let us know what you think about the, the outreach that we're trying to do around it. Oh, I still have that May 18th wild, wildlife event, which you guys are at right now on this page. Um, but really, we, we do want your input and we want to answer your questions. And so please um, do complete that survey or you can even email me directly at ethan.tapper at vermont.gov um, and ask me questions if you have it. So with that um, rushed ending, I am gonna pass it off to Andrea Shortsleeve. Um, Andrea Shortsleeve works with Vermont's Fish and Wildlife Department, who is another one of our partners on this project. Cool, uh, thanks Ethan. Um, so before we kind of dive into the, to the, what we're actually gonna be doing at Catamount and why it's important. Um, I just wanted to kind of take a big, big 20,000 foot view and talk about why Vermont matters and why community forest here matters. Um, so we're part of the largest, most intact, temperate, deciduous forest in the world, which is really cool. Um, we live in a forest that has a global significance just based on its size and, and it's becoming more unique every day as, as our forests become more fragmented. Um, and this large intact forest provides us as a global community, you know, with fresh air, clean water, natural resources, recreational spaces, carbon storage, and it also provides a healthy network of forests and wetlands and rivers for wildlife to move freely across from New York and the Adirondacks all the way out to the Acadian Peninsula in Nova Scotia. Um, so it allows for wide-ranging animals like Canada lynx and black bear and moose to move across this landscape. Um, because we have certain linkage areas that are highlighted on the map that are critical to keeping this big region connected. And if we take a look at Vermont and Williston where that red star is, you can see that six of these priority linkages, linkage areas um, that are needed to keep this big forest intact are in Vermont. So essentially Vermont is really the crossroads for animals moving north and south and east and west all across the region. Um, and the, the large forest blocks in our state make up these linkages and those are highlighted in, in the brown on the map of, the, of Vermont there. And the reason that this is so important is, is based on climate change resilience. We know that connectivity is one of the most important strategies for allowing forests and wildlife to adapt to a new climate. Um, species need to be able to move and adapt and change as the climate changes. And as a conservation community, we're, we're doing a really great job of conserving special places and important properties, but we need to also remember to continue to protect the pathways between these conserved properties as well. And this is just becoming more and more increasingly important as our climate changes. So if we zoom into Williston and into the Catamount Community Forest, which is highlighted in red, and Ethan touched on this, um, 
all the yellow property in the map are properties that are conserved either by private landowners through uh, land trusts or through the town or through the state and federal governments. Um, and you can see how just permanently conserving the Catamount Community Forest and keeping it out of development, that, that whole large block of forest just becomes that much bigger. And if we take a look at another map um, of the different layer, uh, Catamount's in that big purple square, you can really see how it's part of a, a larger connected landscape here in Shipman County. Um, each of those blocks of color represents a different block of habitat, and the deeper the color, so the more red the color is, the bigger the block. Um, blue represents the riparian habitat that is connected through the river, river systems there. Uh, you can see that the town forest sits on a large forest block in the fragmented Champlain Valley and connects, connects um, the wetlands of the lake uh, through an important wildlife crossing under I-89, um, across the Winooski River and all the way into the Mount Mansfield and Camel Hump forest blocks to the east, which are some of our biggest forest blocks in the state. And so the Catamount Community Forest is important to wildlife on the landscape just based where it's located at. But it's also important because of the different features and the diversity of habitat that is present just on its 393 acres. Um, we have 84 acres of, of a deer wintering area, a nice hemlock forest with ravines. Um, there's beautiful stands in northern hardwoods, which are critical for many wildlife species for nesting and foraging. Uh, in those stands, we have tons of trees that produce nuts and fruit for wildlife throughout the year. Um, we have some big, beautiful, clean beech trees. There's basswood, hickory, oak, apple trees, hop horn beam, um, lots of maple. There's also an abundance of snags and root wads and tip ups, which uh, provide important bat habitat and bird habitat throughout the forest. There's edge habitat, which is a transi transition zone between openings of the forest, used for traveling and for safety for a lot of wildlife species. There's eight acres of wetlands and several vernal pools, like Ethan uh, highlighted, that form the base of the food chain throughout the whole forest. And there's old fields and young forests and grasslands, which uh, Mark and Katie will get into. So it's a really unique, cool place. Um, and because of those habitats, it's cool because of those habitats, um, and so I also just wanted to take a minute to talk about a program that the Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, has put together to help enhance some of these cool habitats. Um, the Habitat Stamp is, is a relatively new program. We've had it for about five years. And the basis behind the, the idea behind the program was to generate an opportunity for, for people who don't typically uh, put money into conservation to allow, allow for people to do that and to create a funding source for just habitat conservation in Vermont. Um, so far in, two, well, in 2019 alone, uh, we had $134,000 donated to the habitat stamp and through leveraging that money with, with uh, federal matching dollars, we were able to increase that donation to up to $300,000 uh, to put towards conservation work just in 2019. And we use that money to help manage places like Catamount, create new town forests, acquire new WMAs like Bird Mountain and Mallets Creek up in Colchester. Um, we remove deadbeat dams and cold water streams, um, plant riparian forest buffers, we provide assistance to private landowners, and also create shrubland, shrubland habitat here in Williston and throughout the Champlain Valley. So if you're interested in learning more about that or, or putting some conservation dollars to work, um, go ahead and visit our website and you can find some more information on that there. So with that, I think I'm handing the presentation off to Mark. I think it's going to Katie. I think Katie's up next. Oh. <laughs> I, got, I got it. I know my, I know my order. All right. <laughs> mm. Okay. Hopefully, it looks like this is maybe showing up in presenting view. If it is, I apologize. Um, all right, thanks, Andrea. So I'm going to diverge for a minute to kind of talk about um, the work that I do and why I'm here as a partner on this project. So uh, I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program. Uh, this is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's 
private lands habitat restoration program. Uh, so we work with voluntary landowners to do restoration on their land. So we offer technical uh, or financial assistance to those landowners and to project partners. Um, this, the partners program was originally created in 1987 to work on private land adjacent to national wildlife refuges with the idea being that we wanted to kind of expand the habitat benefit that those refuges offered by doing restoration projects on adjacent land nearby. Um, currently the program exists in every state to implement habitat restoration projects that benefit high priority fish and wildlife species. So those are our species that are federally listed as threatened or endangered. Um, candidate species that are under review for federal listing, uh, our interjurisdictional species, so things that cross state or country boundaries, um, such as our migratory birds, which are just returning now in the spring, um, and at-risk species, which is an initiative um, that the Northeast region of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is focusing on a lot right now, and uh, I'll share a little bit more about that in a couple minutes here. Uh, so the structure of this program, we are completely powered by partnerships. It's a really unique structure for a, a federal organization. Um, so the way that our whole mission is um, for us to work with local partners, state and federal agencies, uh, different towns, and of course our private landowners who are our biggest partners in every project that we do. We have um, a pretty small budget that we get each year and our mission is to combine that budget with our partners budgets basically uh, to effectively leverage our project dollars so it's pretty uncommon that we work standalone on a project it's not unheard of but most of the time we are working with other partners such as audubon vermont vermont fish and wildlife uh, in this instance and we're very much designed to be nimble to meet the changing needs of wildlife in every state so what the Vermont program does may be entirely different from what the West Virginia program or the Colorado program does. Um, and the Vermont program even is kind of in a little bit of a transition right now as we focus on this at-risk species program. Uh, and we're finding that that changes some of the work that we put on the ground. Uh, so in Vermont, the work that we do, um, we have kind of three primary focus areas, which is uh, wetland restoration, which is typically farmland that has been modified at some point. Um, it was formerly a wetland and then it was um, modified to become not a wetland um, to, in order to be farmed. And so a lot of that is, is kind of trying to undo what was done on that land. And that typically comes with um, a permanent conservation easement for that landowner. Um, we do aquatic organism passage, so Andrea mentioned taking out deadbeat dams. Um, we do a lot of culvert retrofits um, to open up streams to allow fish and other aquatic organisms to get upstream into some of those cold water refugia areas as we're thinking about climate change and wanting species to be able to get further up in the watershed. Um, and what I primarily focus on is riparian and upland restoration. Um, and just to give a snapshot of kind of the scale that we work at in the state, um, over a three-year average, um, I was working with 70 different private landowners on 70 different projects to restore 280 acres and 30 miles of stream bank. And if we do it right, if projects go the way we want them to, um, you might not even know that you're looking at a restoration project. Um, and in that vein, there are some maybe kind of hiding in plain sight in, in Williston here. We actually have a long history of working with local partners and the town on riparian projects, particularly along Allen Brook. Um, and a lot of those were initiated because of water quality concerns. Um, and that's a really good fit for us because a lot of these water quality projects can have really important fish and wildlife habitat benefits. So you might want a riparian buffer because you're concerned about water quality. We want it because migratory birds are going to come and spend time in that buffer and might use it for breeding or for foraging. Um, and we want the shade on the stream for fish habitat. Uh, so those projects have been a good example of how we kind of adapt and we work with our partners um, to accomplish everybody's project goal. 
Uh, and even on the Catamount property, that is one of our earliest wetland restoration projects, um, way before my time, but um, that's an early photo from, I think, the 2000, early 2000s of that project. Um, so why, why am I here at, at Catamount? Um, I mentioned the at-risk species program. So within the Northeast region of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which uh, is Maine down to Kentucky now, um, one of our big uh, strategic conservation initiatives is this at-risk species program. And it's a pretty forward-thinking approach to try to implement conservation actions for species that are in decline before they get to the point of being listed as threatened or endangered. We want to do everything we can to keep them from getting to that point where they need that spe special designation. Um, so this has been a close effort with our state fish and wildlife agencies, such as Vermont Fish and Wildlife, um, to go through and determine in each state what are the species that are most at, in need of this extra help and these extra efforts. Uh, so we had an, init an initial species list that was developed in 2017, and we have a new list that's currently being revised and underway, um, hopefully for release in fall of 2020. So the golden-winged warbler is one of the primary species in Vermont that is on that draft list at this point, and hopefully it'll make it through uh, to final inclusion. Uh, so this has elevated the priority of that species for the work that we're doing here in Vermont. So the last few years, we've been working more and more closely with Audubon Vermont to work on projects together, specifically to benefit golden winged warblers. So it's been a little bit of a shift. Of my work normally is focusing on planting things, and uh, now with this work, it's, it's more focused on taking things out um, of the landscape. So as I'm sure Mark will talk about, um, one of the big benefits of these projects is that often we're able um, to accomplish the habitat goals for golden winged warbler. We're able to come in and remove woody invasives from a site. Um, that's in this lower picture, someone is grinding out woody invasives to open up these uh, small openings that's desirable for the bird. Um, so it's, it's been a really nice fit. And as Ethan mentioned, it's been really valuable from a demonstration site perspective. So far we've we've mostly worked kind of in these public areas like Catamount, um, school and town owned lands, because it gives a really nice um, opportunity to kind of showcase the project, um, to talk about different habitat benefits and then for people to come back and see that as it progresses. Um, and but I do always like to kind of drive home that you know we might be saying this project is in the name of golden winged warbler, but work done in the name of one species is going to have a benefit for a whole host of other species by creating this more diverse forested landscape that we're talking about at this site. So we're going to see other migratory birds come in and use these new habitat areas. We're going to have an increase in flowering plant diversity and then correspondingly an increase in pollinator diversity. Um, on some sites, we're gonna see a positive response from reptiles and amphibians. Um, we're seeing more and more that some of these golden wing warbler sites that are in areas closer to streams, that that's um, you know, potentially positive habitat benefit for, for the wood turtle, which is another one of our priority species. So the goal is always to have a project that provides habitat for a whole host of species and not just for one thing, although we often will kind of have that showcase species that we're talking about for a project. So with that, I'll hand it to Mark to uh, get into the details on the birds. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I just had to, my dog decided it was time to play, so I had to step out and, and, oh. let's go back here and we'll start over again. All right, now I'm having technical difficulties. I think I got it. Yeah, I 
have to drag this box and go up there. So um, I was asked here, and it's been a great opportunity to work with all these partners, which we've worked on a number of different properties um, over the past couple of years, many of them uh, very much like Catamount, town owned properties, whether they be at Heinsberg, uh, Middlebury, uh, Charlotte. And our effort really has been working on um, creating these young forest and shrubland habitats that uh, benefit a whole suite of species, as Katie mentioned, but in particular, uh, golden winged warblers. Uh, and when we talk about natural succession and young forest, you know, and what's amazing about the, the Catamount Center or forest is it has this broad breadth of habitat types in it. And these habitat types are um, important to a whole suite of species. I was out there today, I heard bobolinks, uh, I heard prairie warblers. Um, so from the fields all the way into the forest where the wood thrush were singing, uh, this diverse mix is um, really important and particularly for golden winged warblers it's important in that golden winged warblers like this shrubby habitat but having a forest habitat adjacent to that is very important to their, um, their breeding process. And as we kind of move through um, and we look at uh, different habitat types from early succession, uh, farmlands, open farmlands and fields to the back 40, which is slowly growing in. You get a whole suite of species across this continuum. Um, golden winged warblers, towhees, thrashers, woodcock, all kind of sit in the middle of that um, in this shrubland young forest habitat, uh, this mixture of shrubs and saplings. And then of course there's the, um, the forest birds, which are at the far end of that, which take advantage of the more mature setting uh, that's available to them um, in these structures. Um, a lot of the species were focusing on golden winged warbler, which is an awesome bird. Um, we've been doing here at Audubon, Vermont work with them. Uh, at a number of locations. Uh, we did some geolocator work where we put backpacks on these birds and had them um, go all the way down to Colombia, Costa Rica, and Nicaragua. Um, we also find that there's a lot of overlap, again, reiterating what Katie said, with other uh, shrubland species. Uh, the American woodcock, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner, and um, this prairie warbler, which is down in the left-hand corner, uh, this is a bird that was actually shot by um, Taj Shotland uh, on Saturday. So this prairie warbler has been singing away down there, and this is a classic species that you often find associated with golden-winged warblers, uh, woodcock, uh, thrashers, blue-winged warblers, towhees, uh, a whole suite of bird species that depend on this. Um, this open habitat. And we get this habitat in a number of different ways. Uh, regenerating harvests, uh, post-harvest after a cut's been made and things grow in. Um, agricultural fields, fallow agricultural fields, which uh, seem to be growing here in the Champlain Valley as changes take place with the dairy and farming industry. Um, roadsides can be an important habitat uh, where that uh, forest kind of works to shrublands and then power line corridors as well. We've worked with Belco uh, helping them uh, come up with management plans for their power line corridors. And surprisingly enough, uh, the Catamount uh, Community Forest has all of these. And so they're in a, an ideal position to take advantage of these early successional habitats to promote um, habitat for uh, golden winged warbler and all the other species that um, are associated with that. And these things are beautiful birds, I gotta say. Um, I've handled a number of them. Um, they've got this nice golden top and that golden panel on the side. Um, 
they sing pretty, they, you know, their song isn't all that much. It's a buzz, 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 but uh, they're, you know, when they're around, they're often flitting from tree to tree and shrub to shrub. Uh, so a great bird and one that, you know, not too long ago, we didn't think we had that many birds uh, here in the Champlain Valley. This is the habitat they like. They like that um, forest edge with uh, your shrub along the side and that, inter you know, that interspersed herbaceous patches. And this is where one of our best um, management plans that we have come up with, with, which as Katie mentioned, is the removal of invasive buckthorn and honeysuckle. And it creates, creates that, that patch right there in the middle that you see. Oftentimes what we're leaving behind are the native um, shrubs, uh, your dogwoods, your viburnums. And so by working to not only remove these invasive plant species, we're also creating great habitat uh, for golden winged warblers and other shrub obligates. So um, back in the early oh, um, 2010-11, um, the Golden Winged Warbler Working Group came uh, up with uh, a map and maps across its range, which uh, create focus areas for um, Golden Winged Warblers. And as you can see, um, the Southern Champlain Valley and the Catamount you know, Forest lies within uh, what we call Great Lake 16. And so this is one of the focus areas, and it's the area we've primarily been focusing um, at Audubon, Vermont. And if you look all the way at the bottom, it says uh, Great Lake 16, GL 16, the estimated population uh, in 2010 was 20 individuals, and our goal for 2050 was 30 individuals. And what we found uh, when we started looking for these birds across the Southern Champlain Valley, that we probably have closer to 200 to 300 pairs uh, of these uh, birds in that uh, focus area. And this is important because this area is the largest concentration of golden-winged warblers in New England. Uh, they occasionally pop up on the eastern side of Vermont, in the, in the Connecticut River Valley, but pretty much throughout uh, New England, um, the Champlain Valley is their last refuge. And it seems as though their numbers uh, are um, so far larger than we originally thought. We met our population goal for 2050 uh, within a year. So what we did to try to figure out where these birds were, working with um, a graduate student, Stephen Lamond, we created a GIS, uh, a Geographic Information System, Golden Winged Warbler Habitat. And you can see that here, this is the Champlain Valley divided into the Southern Champlain Valley in red and what we call the Northern Champlain Valley in green. And these are all the areas that um, serve as potential habitat for golden winged warblers. And if you notice right on that edge between the green and the red, we've got probably the largest block. And that's Williston, Shelburne, Charlotte, uh, Hinesburg. Um, we pick up other birds down in Waybridge and Middlebury, and then you go further south, you see them down in West Haven, um, Benson and other areas like that. <clears throat> but this area in um, just south of Chittenden County is seems to be an ideal location for the habitat uh, where we're going to find golden winged warblers. Um, when we did this GIS analysis, um, I said we, uh, Stephen Lamond did it. Um, basically, it enabled us to take a look at properties that had uh, sizable portions of their of, of the land in habitat that uh, was favorable to golden winged warblers. And you can see this is Catamount uh, looking down at it. You can see the power line running through it. Uh, those red dots represent survey areas that we're gonna start looking for these birds. And you can see that adjacent large uh, forest habitat, which is uh, to the north. And so our GIS model basically identified Catamount as an area where we can um, 
you know, basically begin to work and look for golden wing warblers and um, some of the other shrubland habitats. Here's the Catabount Center. Ethan already kind of pointed out uh, various different portions down. Um, actually, this is the center north of uh, Governor Chittenden Road there. And, uh, but the area that um, Ethan was, had pointed out, um, we, you know, we're gonna do a lot of this planned early successional management work. And the power line uh, slices right through it. I was out there the other day and it looks like Belco maybe last year came through and managed that. And they've come through and they've removed a lot of invasives and done a great job in leaving a lot of native plants behind. So there's a great opportunity to expand this um, young forest shrubland area for this um, for golden winged warblers and uh, some of the other birds that are associated with that. I did have thrashers out there today, towhees. Uh, I went for a little walk prior to the meeting, so uh, the birds are already there, and we have the opportunity really to create more habitat for them. Now, one thing that I'd like to talk about, and I focused on the early successional habitat, <clears throat> but there's a new idea that's out there, which is called patch trading. And basically it is, it means that not only is this young forest, early successional shrubland great for the birds that breed in it, but it's also a very important um, uh, habitat for our deep forest birds. Birds like the black throated blue warbler, the wood thrush, Eastern peewee and uh, black throated green. I haven't heard the peewees back, it's a little bit early, but I picked up the rest of these birds using that forest habitat. And what happens is after they're done breeding, they actually move into this early successional shrubland habitat um, with their young. The dense structure and the abundance of food provides um, protection from predators and the ability for um, their young and them to get ready for their migration south. On the reverse side of that, um, golden winged warblers will actually move into the deeper forest. Uh, the males bring the male young into the forest with them. The females stay in the shrubby areas, but the forest component is uh, critical to um, that habitat and complements uh, the golden winged warbler habitat as well as complementing the habitat structure that many of our forest birds need. And there's a number of local projects um, as have already been talked about. I think our first one was at Charlotte Wildlife Park about 10 years ago. Um, we had a cousin of the golden winged warbler, the blue winged warbler, one that I banded four years ago, show up again this year. Uh, Dupreix Park, uh, we were able to work with um, uh, Andrea and the Habitat Stamp Program, uh, which provided funding along with Conservation Commission uh, there in Heinsberg uh, in order to do some grinding and removal of invasive species. We're working with the Hannaford Career Center down in Wright Park, uh, where we're bringing students in to do the work for us, and they're gaining um, really good knowledge as, far as, as to how to manage for these species as well as uh, honing their chainsaw skills as they drop some of the bigger trees. And more recently, this past winter, we had a second, um, a second year of winter work at Champlain Valley Union High School. We're work, working on their campus and working with students there to promote uh, golden winged warbler habitat at that site. Uh, so Catamount uh, comes in with uh, a number of different projects, town-owned projects that are already underway. And with that, I will, um, I, I didn't put a golden wing. This is a blue-winged warbler, but um, it's one that's up close and personal, and I'll hand it over to Ethan um, for questions. All right, thanks, Mark. Stop sharing. There you go. Um, so let's see what we got here. So if you do have questions, um, you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a, uh, a bar that pops up and there's a chat icon. Please just plug it into the chat box there. Um, so, so here's one to get us started. Um, 
how has uh, the current U.S. administration affected your budgets and programs? Have you, have, have you had to cut back on many uh, projects and programs? And I guess that would be a question mostly for, for both Katie and, and Andrea. Sure. Uh, it's been, it's strange times for sure. <laughs> I think, I think we all can say. Um, we, I, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and particularly the Partners Program, I think we're very fortunate in that we tend to fare very well um, in a bipartisan manner. It's, it's hard to um, argue with doing restoration work with private landowners. Um, it's, it's pretty appealing to both sides, but um, Generally, we're we're pretty kind of out of out of the fray there. Um, I think that a kind a stranger part of it um, from the program side is that we've been without upper leadership for a long time. We we finally just had uh, a director of our agency named, and several other agencies are still going without directors, and um, that does start to trickle down, and it's kind of. Um, of a strange world to be living in to not necessarily have anyone at the helm yeah i'll say um we're we're not too impacted by um the administration yet um at least with the habitat stamp level uh, mostly because it's through uh, donations and um matching funds through that. And uh, I think the biggest thing is the, the, the COVID spending right now will impact our budget later down the line. But so far our habitat stamp money is, is uh, still going to habitat projects. So, and for the, for the foreseeable future it will be. And I'm gonna just jump in here. And <clears throat> that's what's uh, so key about these partnerships is because um, Audubon, we provide technical assistance on the ground through funding sources like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and private donation, which um, assist Ethan and Katie and Andrea in the delivery of the on the ground pieces there. So I mentioned CVU, you know, that uh, project there over the past two years has been, all of that work has been um, covered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Partners Program. Um, and again, you know, the Habitat Stamp uh, project gets the work done on the ground and Audubon can provide that technical assistance. So it's really a coming together of all these different resources to make this work happen. So um, one thing that I'd, I'd love to delve into a little bit more um, is the, the specifics. So we, we've sort of talked about the habitat that we want to create and this type of uh, the conditions that we're sort of uh, creating, but um, I was wondering if, if either Katie or Mark, you could describe a little bit more about what creating early successional habitat in the way that we're planning on doing it, creating golden wing warbler, what that will actually look like on the ground, uh, the equipment, what, the, what it looks like um, when that actually happens. Do you want me to go, Katie? So again, one of our best management practices that we found out is this removal of invasive um, plant species. And uh, that can be done in a number of different ways. It can be done manually, which is uh, time consuming and tedious. But one of the ways that we found that really works is to bring, on, bring in mechanized equipment. Um, I think it was Katie that had the picture of that small excavator with a grinding head on it. And this is a device that we've used that basically comes in and, and can chip a 15 foot tall buckthorn in about two minutes. And so um, by coming in and very selectively with that excavator, removing the invasives while leaving the natives there, um, we can have some success with that. The other piece would be um, more along the lines of what Katie does, which is to work from the ground up and do plantings. So I think, you know, after the work is done, um, there will be an initial look where you'll basically see piles of wood chips here and there um, with the structure and habitat uh, opened up. I'll leave it up to you to describe what uh, the harvest portion will look like when they get into the forest. 
But within uh, a couple of months, the goldenrod comes right back up through there. And um, it's really difficult to tell, uh, you know, that that habitat was even managed. I'll th I can try to pull that picture back up. We'll see if that'll work. Uh, I guess I can't make that larger, but as, as Mark was saying, it, it basically just, you, you get wood chips on site and it, it does look kind of shocking at first. It looks very different. Um, but then as soon as things green up, um, this was at CVU this winter. And if we, I don't know, Mark, if you've been out there, if we went out there right now, it, it probably does not look anything like this anymore. No, I, I was, I was out there the other day. Am I still on mute? No, you're, we can hear you, Mark. Oh, okay. I was out there the other day and it, you know, it still looks a little bit rough, but things are already uh, growing back up. I've been working with a student at, um, for their project graduation, uh, who's been doing some uh, coming in and removing some invasives that have re-sprouted. But uh, another site that we worked on was Japregs Park. So this is the initial look, but this uh, machine is really nimble and can get into places and uh, we don't have to take everything out in order to achieve the habitat goal. Yeah, and I, I think another thing that I try and talk to landowners a lot about is that we sort of, as humans, we have this like unrealistic, unrealistic expectation about what forests and other ecosystems are supposed to look like. So we have this idea about what's a, a tidy forest, what's a well-managed forest, and it's usually based in some aesthetic sense that we have that has nothing to do with how forests actually grow and develop and that these really diverse, resilient forests that have, uh, you know, great wildlife habitat and are producing all these services, they don't look how many people would expect them to look. They look messy and, and actually natural disturbances, you know, in this case, we're sort of creating our own natural disturbance, but natural disturbances that cause trees to fall over and stuff like that are not disasters, they're actually a really important part of how forests and other ecosystems grow and develop. And so part of that, I think, you know, like we're going to go in there, create essentially a natural disturbance to create this specific kind of habitat. And it will look messy, but it's also part of that, part of the demonstration and the education of this is helping people understand that it's supposed to look messy and, that, and it's going to continue to look messy probably as it regenerates it'll look you know so less obviously managed but we hope that it will continue to be this incredibly diverse sort of messy looking irregular um, habitat and that's that's sort of one of the points um, the other thing I wanted to mention briefly too to, to your point Mark about and Katie about um, that Goldwing warbler habitat management where we're like grinding down buckthorns at Catamount, um, especially where we want to put those early successional patches, those, those larger openings to attract stuff like woodcock, um, using this grinding equipment is also a means to control the invasive species are there, that are there. So I was out there with the UVM group, uh, when was it? This fall. And you know, the, in some of these areas uh, where we want to put these, these patch cuts, uh, you know, there's 40 or 50,000 stems of common buckthorn to the acre and nothing else. And so we can also use that chipping as a means to control them, to, to knock them down and get them to a place where they're a little bit easier to manage. I want to throw one more thing in there too. One unique aspect that we have um, at Catamount is the fact that um, <clears throat> from a bird perspective, um, <clears throat> there's a wealth of data that's already been collected over the years by the Green Mountain Audubon Society. So having that um, pre-management information um, is going to allow uh, us to um, see how these birds react to the cuts and to the management and allow us to adjust um, our practices as, as need be over time. So. Uh, kudos to Green Mountain for uh, spending the time out there uh, collecting all that data and giving us a baseline uh, from which to start from. There's another question here from Logan. Um, 
And Logan says, I think this is a, a, a plant for me, but Logan says, depending on the extent, can private landowners realistically rid their properties of invasive exotic plants without the use of herbicide? Um, and so I put that, put that to you, Katie, Mark, Andrea, to see, to see what you think about it. Andrea. <laughs> I think it depends on how much time you have and uh, what else you have going on in your life. Um, <laughs> I think it, yeah, you're right. It, it totally depends on the extent and type of invasive species you have. Um, you can make a dent in your population without using herbicide, but um, it's definitely an important tool in the toolbox that we use. It helps, it's very effective and, um, you know, gives you a leg up. If you don't want to continue using herbicide, you can knock them back once and then go back with mechanical or manual treatments instead. I don't know, you guys have other opinions? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've worked on uh, properties <clears throat> where um, herbicide has been used and where it's, it hasn't been used. <clears throat> and where it hasn't been used, what we really try to get is to a place where um, getting some kind of brush hog or something like that out there on site to repeatedly repeatedly hit, hit these invasives can kind of effectively keep things at bay. Um, you know, sometimes when landowners look at, a, you know, a vast sea of honeysuckle, it's almost unthinkable. But if you can knock that down to ground level and you can get it to a place where, you know, a brush hog or some uh, mowing system can keep it down, um, you have a start and you're creating good bird habitat. Do you want to add to that, Katie, or should I? I think, I think we covered it pretty well. Um, yeah, we, we kind of run the gamut on all of our projects. There's, there's sites where I think our restoration goals aren't, aren't possible without limited use of herbicide. And as Andrea said, it's a really important tool. And then there's sites where we're able to get away without it. And it depends on your manpower and what type of infestation you're looking at and what your long-term goal is. You know, Do you want zero invasives on your property or is there some percentage that you're okay with having things persist at? I, had, I, I often say when I talk about this that, it, that it's a capacity issue because in most cases, and there's some species that are just incredible, like Japanese knotweed, which is just like almost unkillable. Um, but with many of these species, it is possible, physically possible to like antagonize them through pulling and cutting until they die. The issue is just can you do that over, you know, if you're like pulling out these, you know, this one little area of plants and you have this, this property that has this massive invasive plant infestation, you know, can you invest the time to even actually kill that plant? And if you can, um, you know, can, is there other places on your property where you could be investing your time also? And these invasive plants are such an existential threat to our forests and to the wildlife they support, among other things, that in many cases I, I have, become like an advocate for the the super concentrated and targeted use of herbicide um, in the killing of invasive plants because in many cases you know I, I, I think about a few years ago the county foresters went out um, we have this every year we have uh, we spend a couple days together and visit one of the counties and it rotates around we went to Wyndham County and there was a park where there was one guy who was retired and uh, really wanted to help the invasive plant problem in this park that was really intense and really didn't want to use herbicide. And he pulled out this um, oriental bittersweet that he had pulled out. And the root of this oriental bittersweet was 100 feet long. It went out of sight and he had stashed it there to show us. And so he spent half a day, you know, digging out this, this oriental bittersweet root with his hands. Um, which is great. Like he, he got it, you know, he took care of the problem. It's just a question of, in many cases, when I see people really struggling with mechanical removal, which is what we call cutting and pulling, um, in many cases, they could have a much more greater positive impact on their landscape if they, in the case of having, you know, a, a larger infestation of invasive plants, used a little bit of herbicide and again, used it in sort of this really targeted way. Um, I actually, I have a video that I did about, um, 
that I made about cut stump herbicide application with this really cool tool called the Buckthorn Blaster, um, which is on my YouTube channel. So you can look for that on my YouTube channel as well. Um, there's a lot to be said about invasive exotic plants. So we, it's good to keep on having these conversations. Um, I'm, I'm reading now a question from Kate Warner, um, who again, Kate works for the Trust for Public Land and was a, a huge driving force behind getting the Catamount Community Forest acquired by the town and conserved in the first place. And she asks, um, if remove, removing the Christmas tree plantation, completely removing the Christmas tree plantation is part of the long-term plan um, or not, um, if we wanna bring in fully native species. Um, the Christmas tree plantation, in, so in Chittenden County, uh, the only balsam fir that you really see is in, except at very high elevations, like on top of Camel's Hump, is in these Christmas tree plantations, which people very ambitiously planted, right? And then like never sold the trees. Uh, and Catamount is one of those. Um, so there's balsam fir. There's also some Scots pine, which is not native to the United States. Um, and some other species like white spruce that are planted there. And I would say, Kate, that um, one of the really interesting things about that area in Catamount in general is that, yes, those, those species, with the exception of the Scots pine, um, are, they are actually native species to Vermont. Um, and they are actually really unique in Chittenden County because there's such an unusual, you know, there's nowhere else in Chittenden County where we have like spruce fir thickets. Um, and so I think in general, I'm actually coming around to the idea of preserving some of those areas just as this really novel, weird habitat uh, that, that is just exists there. It's not invasive. It's not, uh, it doesn't, I don't see it as a threat to any of our other habitat types. I just see it as this weird asset of this sort of displaced native species of trees. Um, do you have any thoughts about that, Mark, about the balsam fir thickets and the Champlain Valley of Chittenden County, Vermont? as a habitat type? Um, you know, I, oftentimes when we talk about birds, it's not so much the species as it is the structure. And so I'm sure those uh, fur are gonna be a seed producer. You know, you have the opportunities for finches and other things to take advantage of them. Um, I, I don't necessarily see it as a negative, you know, when we do talk about structure and creating structure and forests, we like to see diversity at multiple layer levels from down low to mid-story to um, more mature trees. And the one thing about those plantations is you lose everything but that upper canopy. Um, so, uh, you know, breaking them up so there's a little growth in between that's not invasive wouldn't be a bad thing. And that, and that um, Christmas tree area is within the area that we're thinking about doing some young forest habitat creation and some golden wing work. And so we, we can probably do both things, but it's sort of an interesting resource that we have. Um, so with that, uh, I think that we will wrap this up. And I wanna thank uh, Melinda at the town of Williston so much for hosting. Um, and I want to thank Katie and Andrea and Mark um, for being here and being and presenting uh, and representing their good organizations. Oh, I see Carl has a has a question. You have a question, Carl? Can you uh, let me unmute you? Here you go. Okay, great. Well, I was I was interested in Mark's um, comments um, and Katie's comments about the plans for Golden Wing uh, habitat work. Um, and as Mark mentioned, uh, Green Mountain has been uh, monitoring birds at Catamount for umpteen years, at least 15 years. And in all that time, we have never seen a golden wing warbler on Catamount. And not only us, but if you look on eBird, uh, no, uh, no one has recorded a golden wing warbler on Catamount. Couple, um, several years ago, we recorded a couple of blue wing warblers and they were in the area that you're talking about um, uh, for the Golden Wing Restoration. So I am really excited about the work that you guys are gonna do here because it's gonna be easy to measure. You're starting at uh, ground zero and any Golden Wing Warblers we see from the point where you start. Um, so again, I just like to uh, applaud this project and I'm gonna be very interested to see how it 
comes to fruition. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, and Carl, you know, have 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 you seen many prairies on your bird walks? No, we. Uh, it's as you s said today. There's been a prairie warbler up there for the last uh, week or so, maybe less than a week, and that, as I recall, is only our second recording of uh, prairie warbler. We did see one several years ago, yeah. and again, in both occasions, it was uh, very near the power line, long and in, in the area where you want to do that. Golden yeah, so, so that's a good indicator that, you know, the, the habitat there may be maturing a little bit to the point where it's getting a little bit more like, you know, denser in spots. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too is golden wings are not big fans of um, coniferous trees. Uh -huh. And so some of the removal, especially of the old pine stands and things like that, uh, that are planned for the forest uh, may enhance that habitat um, as well. Good. And then I see one more question. Somebody had emailed me or put in a note about working with students at CVU. Um, I'd love to. We have been, we did some work with students at uh, the UVM natural areas, or not at CVU, but it, from UVM. And any way we can get students involved in this kind of work, especially with um, the property, the UVM property adjacent to it, um, that it's a great opportunity. Yeah, and I think all of us actually work, frequently work with UVM students um, on various projects. I know Melinda does and, and I do. Um, I think that Mark and Andrea and Katie, have you guys all worked with UVM on projects like this before? Yeah, it's an amazing resource, especially to have in, in Chittenden County. Um, so thanks for that. and. Uh, and with that, I want to point to everybody in, the, in that chat box, um, if you pull it up, there is a link that Kim, uh, thanks Kim, that Kim posted to, to the survey. That'd be great if you all could take. Um, and, uh, and again, you can also find that on the Town of Williston website, and you can also find the draft forest management plan on the Town of Williston website. Um, and I will also type in my, my email address and feel free to, if you have any questions, um, that you can just give me a shout. And so with that, I want to again thank, thank everybody for, for putting this on um, and for attending tonight. And uh, please stay tuned to Williston Front Porch Forum and um, you can join uh, my mailing list. At, uh, just give me an email at that email address, ethan.tapper.vermont.gov. Um, and we will be doing hopefully some more outreach around this, this cool stuff at Catamount. Um, so you have lots of opportunities to learn about it and also um, to ask questions. So thank you all very much. Thank Thanks you guys. Everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks everyone. Good night.